Blog Talk Radio. Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is William Bell. I want to welcome you to Two Guys. Well, let's see. Let me get my mic going. <laughs> it's better that way when I have the mic turned on. But uh, good evening, everyone. This is William Bell with um, Two Guys in a Bible. Don Preston is uh, busy with uh, some business he had to take care of, and as a result, will not be uh, with us on tonight, on this evening, but we are delighted to be with you, and we'll be uh, speaking on a topic, I have to even go back and look at the <laughs> look at the um, title of uh, the topic, and, uh, and tell you what it is, but it's then comes the end and the beginning. Gifts, the last days, and the New Jerusalem. Rather long title. But again, then comes the end and the beginning. Gifts, the last days, and the New Jerusalem. So we're going to be talking about that and try to weave together uh, some of the themes that Dunn and I have been talking about together as far as the gifts of the Spirit in the last days. But in addition to that, and in connection with that, we're going to be talking about the time of the end and also the beginning, because all of those integrally connected. They're all tied together. And so as, um, as we progress in the study, we'll try to cover as much of that as we can tonight. But we're always delighted to have you with us. Uh, I think this is my first time being back because I was out last week. My wife and I were in Orlando. We had a very good time. We met um, a couple there. Actually, we had already met them prior to going and had arranged to see them, but they have um, made their journey from dispensationalism and through a few other things and found their way to the full preterist view and are a very uh, delightful couple who are very interested in helping to see the um, truth of God's word as far as the uh, preterist view continue to be taught and to be supported. And of course, uh, we are looking forward to working with them continually. They are also planning to be at our annual eschatology conference in October in Memphis, and uh, we want to invite you to that. But there are several things that are going on. I know that Holger Neubauer and Steve Baisden, along with John Watson, uh, particularly John Watson, is sponsoring it in Indianapolis. And unfortunately, I'm not able to go and was looking forward to possibly doing that. But it is April the 20th, 20th through the 22nd. And they're expecting a huge crowd there with some fantastic announcements that are going to be made. So you don't want to miss those. And in addition to that, of course, you've got the Preterist Pilgrim Weekend that is going to take place at uh, Dunn's Artmore Convention Center, at, at the Artmore Convention Center. It doesn't belong to him. But um, he has been there for years and has done an outstanding job. So there is uh, the conference that is going to take place there. And I think that's somewhere around the second week of July. You may want to go to his website and verify it. 
uh, and uh, look forward to attending, but that will be a great event as well. And there also, uh, there's another event coming up in May, and I believe that's May the 3rd through the 8th or 3rd through the 5th, somewhere in that, that neighborhood, might be the 5th through the 8th, but it's in um, California, and uh, the Brethren out on the West Coast are going to are sponsoring a conference, and we are looking forward to being with them, meeting them. Um, I've heard great things about them. I've interacted with them on Facebook and on YouTube, and they are uh, really getting some great things going. Paul Jarman and John Holt, and uh, I think it's um, uh, Brent um, and several others out there who are uh, doing a great job. And uh, as the, the preterist view is spreading, as a matter of fact, you know, people keep saying that, you know, this view is dying out. And I got on YouTube the other day and someone sent me a link about uh, this gentleman um, in the dispensational movement uh, making a presentation on the preterist view because they said this thing is really growing. And uh, it's growing among just about every religious group out there that you can find. And it just demonstrates the fact that people can see that all things have been fulfilled and that uh, we are uh, continually getting this message out and sharing it. And it's making a tremendous difference in people's lives along the way. We do have those who, of course, are uh, still opposing it. But the more exposure it gets, the more uh, people will be uh, privy to it. And even as they were, you know, talking about it and trying to run it in the ground, uh, you know, the wise people always, when they hear something, you know, curiosity, as they say, curiosity kills the cat. But when they hear something, they're going to um, take note. They're going to investigate. I remember that from my own experience when I was uh, actually, I had, uh, I think I'd already started learning the preterist view when I was at the, um, yeah, I, I had, because um, it was during my first quarter, uh, back when they had quarters, I don't know if they have semesters at school now, but when I was in seminary, they had quarters. But during the first quarter is when I became a full preterist. I was already what people today call a partial preterist. But during that time, I um, remember hearing some of the instructors talk about Max King, and they always spoke about him as, you know, saying some things that, of course, they didn't agree with, and they would quote the text, and they would give an interpretation uh, that he had given that was very similar to what I understood about the passage. And of course, as a result of that, I had to go inquire. So when people start raising these um, questions and uh, making these presentations about preterism, someone sitting out there with an open mind and an honest heart who is seeking the truth, they're going to be inquisitive enough to go and do their own research and find out. Some of them are probably already about to make decisions and they just need to find a little bit more information, confirm and help them to, uh, to grasp it a little bit better. And when they can find a resource, then it just takes them all away. And so they're going to do that. And as a result, when people started seeing whether you, you know, they were partial preterists or whatever situation they were, when people started noticing that, then they start trying to put a damper on everything. In other words, put a lid on it so nobody hears about it. You know, let's not give them any airtime or, or any pulpit time, I should say, back at the time. Uh, let's keep them out of the pulpits. Let's try to keep this view uh you know, covered up as much as we possibly can. And then came things like cassette tapes and um, CDs <laughs> and MP3s and audio, uh, excuse me, DVDs and all of these things and the internet, et cetera. And uh, now video and you name it, you know, all of these uh, forms of media are out there. And so there's no way it can be contained anymore. I mean, the Pandora's box is open as far as uh, this truth is concerned. And there's no way to put it back in. It's like those feathers in the pillow. Uh, you're not going to be able to put it back in. It's just going to continue to grow. Well, at any rate, let's go ahead and talk about uh, some of the things that we uh, want to discuss. Uh, let's, first of all, look in Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew 24, as we've talked about the gifts ceasing uh, in 70 AD, and thus miraculous gifts not continuing, people have a problem with that. They 
They fail to understand the difference between the function of the Holy Spirit and the person or the relationship that we have with the Spirit. And because the function of the Holy Spirit was miraculous in nature and designed to bring about and fulfill those things that were being revealed in the New Testament and to bring a consummation to the things of the Old Testament, since those miracles ceased in the first century, people think that the Holy Spirit went totally out of business. And, of course, some have even shut down God and everything uh, as a result. And we do not believe that that is an accurate uh, perspective. So I want to talk about that a little bit. So in Matthew 24, Jesus spoke uh, in verse 14 and said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness to all nations to all the inhabited earth, and then the end would come. Now, we have no question about the fact that the Bible speaks of an end would come. Again, because I think I could have missed that text, I'm going to say it again. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, in all the orcumene, the inhabited earth, as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, when the Bible speaks about the end, we don't have too many people who object to the end coming as far as the preterist world, if you please, is concerned. However, this involved the time for the end of the gifts. When we look at the passages that relate to the end of the gifts, in connection with the end, Jesus used this statement several times. Uh, In talking about the end, he had spoken of it in Matthew 24 and verse 3, saying, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming or your parousia, your presence, and of the end of the age. So what they were talking about was the end of the age of Moses. That's the end that was in view. And that end being in view is also spoken about in a couple of other texts in Matthew. Uh, One particularly would be Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse, uh, well, no, I don't want that one. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13 with the parable of the tares. This is the one that I I want. Uh, Verse 39, he says, the enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. So there's that term again that's used in Matthew 24. It's used about five times in the scriptures. And the text says, um, the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be in the end of this age. The Son of Man will uh, send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, notice verse 45. See, this is why we titled the lesson, Then Comes the End and the Beginning. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is what takes place after the end. In other words, we have a beginning. It's not just the end that the Bible speaks about, but it is also the beginning. And so we have to find where to place these miraculous gifts in terms of what the prophets had spoken, as well as what uh, the the apostles, uh, the Lord and the apostles had spoken. Now, let's keep that end in mind for just a moment as we turn to Matthew, the 28th chapter. In Matthew chapter 28, and the verse is... Uh, 19 and 20, verses 19 and 20. This is when Jesus, after his resurrection and prior to his ascension, said, all authority and power has been given to me, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you 
always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, I've had a couple of people who have made arguments. There's been more than a couple, actually. But two notable predators who have made arguments, uh, and especially those, uh, one of whom, rather, who believes that we are yet in the miraculous age, will come to this text and say, Jesus said he was going to be with them until the end of the age. And he argues, if the gifts ceased in 70 AD, then Christ is no longer with us. That's one of the first people that I heard make this particular argument. Well, if that is the case, and we allege that these gifts are still future, or as others who claim that even the coming is yet future, the end of the age is yet future, then they're going to have a problem, particularly those who argue that it is yet future are going to have a problem, uh, because if this text means that is the end of a relationship with Christ, and in this case it would be a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because they were baptized into uh, that relationship, then it would mean that that relationship would end at the time of the coming, no matter where you placed it, even if you placed it into the future. However, we just read from Matthew chapter 13, and the text said, at the time of the harvest, then the righteous would shine as the sun in the kingdom. So for those who want to make the end the end, then what do they do about the kingdom? You see, they try to make an end of the kingdom, and we're going to talk about that a little bit because it's uh, is focused on this as well. But now let's take a look in terms of the gifts. Oh, before we do that, let's continue to look at this text. Those who are trying to say that this is the end of everything are misapplying this text and make it refer to try to make it refer to the kingdom, to Israel, to everything that was promised in the Old Testament. In other words, they want the beginning to be the end. They want the end of the Old Covenant, but they also want the end of the New as well at the same time. This text is referring to Jesus being with the saints through the miraculous gifts. It's a parallel to Mark chapter 16 and the verses 20. It's not referring to his relationship in terms of their having a relationship with the Lord, a reference to that function or that work of the Holy Spirit. In Mark 16, you will notice he said the very same thing, but it shows how he would be with them. Mark 16 and the verses 20. The Bible says, so then, verse 19, after the Lord had spoken to them, of course, to his apostles, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And, of course, when you read uh, verses 15 through 18, uh, you can see that he's talking about the preaching of the gospel and the confirming of that gospel with those miraculous gifts. But then he says, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out, meaning the apostles, and preached everywhere. But notice now, the Lord working with them and confirming the word, the accompanying signs. So what was happening was the Lord was working with them through the miracles. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. The Lord shed for this, which you now, now see and hear. And so it was through that confirming work of those miracles, as we find in Hebrews 2, 2 and 3, or 2, yes, 2 and 3, and 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this is the manner in which the Lord was working with them. So when he said in the 20th verse of Matthew, 
lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, we need to put the two passages together in order to see how he was with them. He's talking about the miraculous gifts. He wasn't talking about their shining in the kingdom as the sun, because that takes place at the time of the end. That is the beginning. But we have so many who are wanting to make the beginning the end, or we have some who want to make the beginning the end. Now, with that being the case, and let me just give one more scripture on that, and then I'm going to move on, because I know we don't have a lot of time to develop everything that uh, needs to be developed. But let's talk about this a little further from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where you have very same or similar concept with this confirming work of the, uh, of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 4, the Bible talks about the gifts. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge. Well, this utterance and knowledge is by divine inspiration even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So there's that confirming work that was taking place in that first century generation with the gifts of the Spirit. So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation or the apocalypsis of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the parousia spoken of in Matthew 24. That's the time of the end in verse 14. But he says, who will confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they were eagerly waiting for the uh, return of Christ, and they would be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what happens when that arrives? Then the righteous would shine as the sun, where? In the kingdom. Now, in Matthew 24 and verse 35, we have the end and the beginning, spoken of in that verse. The text says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so what we're looking at is something that ceases to be and something that continues. Now, I was listening to a presentation that was made um, I don't know when it was made, but I was listening to the presentation where an attempt was being made to respond to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7 on the fact that the Bible says that of the increase of the government, that is of the kingdom, and peace, there would be no end. And the attempt was being made to explain away what the Bible means when it says no end. Now, I'm sure those of you who are aware understand uh, what I'm talking about, because, you know, this is one of the arguments of the Israel-only paradigm. So let's take a look at it for just a moment. I don't want to get too heavy into this, but because it applies to so many things, uh, we, can take, we can take a look at. So in Isaiah chapter 9, because this has a direct bearing, I mean, this is the kingdom shining as the sun. It is the time of the parousia, etc. And it is when these gifts have ceased. But in Isaiah 9, we have the text 6 and 7, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. 
the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, what we have is an attempt to make the beginning the end. And there was even a word study suggested from Isaiah 9 that actually blew up in the face of the argument that was being made or a person that was trying to make the argument. Now, when you look at the Hebrew of this text and even look at the, just look at the context, let's just take the simple context to begin with. The scripture here says there would be no end. You know, this is like the argument that we make on the term at hand. When you look at it, Numbers 24, what verse is that? Uh, what, 17 or somewhere in that context, Numbers 24, 14. Um, I see him, but not now. I beheld him, but not near. And I remember Don Preston uh, brought up the point many years ago when speaking with, you know, men like Wayne Jackson and um, several others who were using the elasticity of time prophecy and claiming that at hand, didn't mean near after all the years of preaching against premillennialism and dispensationalism, et cetera. And then when they started to encounter the preterist view, they start, started to say that at hand doesn't mean near, doesn't mean uh, something that was imminent and, and soon to come. Well, Balaam said he saw him, but not now and not near. So if not near or not at hand, does not mean not near. What does at hand mean? And um, we start making these arguments that reverse the actual meanings of the terms. Not near means not near. Near means near. But if you're going to say near means not near, then what does not near mean? Wouldn't it have to mean the opposite? Well, that's part of the problem that you get when you look at Isaiah chapter 9. Because in verse 3 of Isaiah 9, the text says, You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. But there's uh, a marginal reference here. And even when you look it up in the Hebrew and you look it up in the Septuagint, and uh, your marginal reference will tell you that. And even the speaker acknowledged it. You have multiplied the nation and not increased its joy. And so if you look at the marginal reference on verse 3, it will say that the um, one of these verses I can't even pronounce here, Kiri and the Targum, uh, Ketib and Vulgate read, not increased joy. The Septuagint reads, most of the people you brought down in your joy. So rather than increase, it was actually a decrease or a non-increase. So when you get and look at the actual uh, Hebrew or these alternate renderings, that's one of the renderings there. And if you read the context, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. And so from the context, it would appear that they are not increased, which goes along with the trans, uh, translation, uh, or rather with the marginal reference. But there you have in the very same context, just based on that, one text says not increased, and the other says increased. So if you're going to make increase to mean it comes to an end, it doesn't increase. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. Then what do you do with not increased? Does that mean it will? See, we've gotten to the point now where we have to start saying 
what doesn't end ends and what does end does not end. How does that work? Or we got to say that what does not end and what ends ends. So we don't have a beginning anywhere. We just have all ends. Confusing? Yeah, for sure. But when you get into the meaning of the terms, uh, you've got several kindred terms here in the Hebrew. One of the terms means, and, and the word is from Lamarba. It is Strong's number forty six, number forty seven sixty six, uh, from the root marba, and it means multiplication, increase. Additional terms, multiplication, coverings, cushions spread out. And it lists all the roots. You can look up 4765, look up 4767, look up, um, I think there's some others here that I will give. Amplitude, fullness. And the reference is Gesinius, Hebrew, Chalde, Lexicon of the Old Testament, page 506. As well as Strong's Concordance, which I'm giving these numbers to. Another uh, term is multitude, magnitude, that's 4768, a very great uh, part, progeny, increase to a family, interest, usury, as in the increase of the principal. Now, if you're getting interest on your money, is it increasing or no? even talks about a fetus growing interest, to take interest. So all of the words, along with the root of the term, speak of increase and not of a decrease. And so, or not as something that ceases. And then you have the text that says, of course, uh, the increase of his government, there will be no end. Now, let's... uh, Let's look at some of these. uh, Let's look at the root, which is 7235 in Strong's. It means to increase in whatever respect, to bring in abundance, be an authority, bring up, continue, enlarge, excel, exceedingly, be full of, make greater, greatly, greatness, grow up, keep, increase, be long, be given, have, make, use, uh, have more in number. Gather, overtake, yield, much greater, more, multiply, plenty, process, uh, store thoroughly, etc. So the whole idea of the term is to increase. And yet, we are hearing that it doesn't mean to increase. Now, another part of this is to understand what the kingdom is and to understand who Israel is. When we think about Israel, let's just go back to um, let's go back to the beginning. And you look at, you know, we have this this view that wants to say Israel means only the twelve tribes. You have the two southern tribes, and you have the ten northern tribes, and the whole story of redemption is only about those 12 tribes. That's rather interesting, at least to me, because when God redeemed Israel, the Bible says there was a mixed multitude, not a mixed two or three, but a mixed multitude that came out of Egypt with them. And if they were Egyptians or even servants of the Egyptians, which they could have been, but the Bible certainly says that some of them were Egyptians, a mixed multitude. They were Cushites and others, you know, sons of Ham, if you please, that came out of Egypt with Israel. Now, 
They weren't physical descendants of Israel, but they certainly were considered as Israel. They were those who were redeemed with them. They were a part of Israel. They certainly were given the law. There is nothing that says that when they came out of Israel, I mean, came out of Egypt, that God didn't give them the law. And so how do we get to this point where we're only talking about the 12 tribes of Israel for Israel? We're making a distinction or making a limitation where there is no limitation, as far as I'm concerned. But even beyond that and before that, if we're going to limit everything to the 12 tribes, how do we include those who were prior to the 12 tribes? In other words, even when we're talking about from Adam or Abel on down up to the time of Abraham, you still have a broader group, and yet they are considered with Israel. So if that's who we're talking about, we're not talking about simply that group that came out of Egypt, and yet that's where people want to limit them. So if you're going to look at Hebrews 9 and 15 and say, and for this cause is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the First Testament, those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And you're going to limit that to the 12 tribes, that is, the physical descendants, only what happens in chapter 11 when you go back and talk about Abel and Noah and Enoch and all the rest of them who lived before them, where the scripture says these all died in faith. I don't see where they were under the first covenant that was given under Moses. That's one of the problems I have with, um, with understanding that. But here's the other part of that. If you look at that and you define Israel as those who were joined to the nation or who be became a part of the nation, and they are not focused on just simply the physical descendants of Jacob, because Israel was certainly larger than the, merely the physical descendants of Jacob. And you talk about the kingdom having no end, you've still got to deal with that. Because here's what the Bible says about the kingdom. It says, for example, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 25 and following, that it is compared with a kingdom that has an end or with uh, a heaven and earth that has an end. And so let's, let's take a look at that um, very quickly from Hebrews chapter 12. In verse 25, the Bible says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape, who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. Those were the things of the old covenant. That's the old heaven and earth that is spoken of in Matthew 24 and 35. Things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may what? May remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So on the one hand, we've got something that can be shaken, something that can end. But on the other hand, there was something that was coming that could not be shaken, that could not be moved. So how do we end up moving what cannot be moved? 
the text says it was a kingdom that could not be uh, that could not be moved. Now, when we look in, for example, um, Revelation chapter twenty-one, the text says, "I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem." Descending out of God from heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And behold, a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now, from whence did it come? It came down to earth. I mean, that's what I understand. That's what. The text appears to say, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Now, this is the kingdom that could not be moved. This is the kingdom that the text says may re- that it would remain. This is the kingdom that it is said has no end. So we have the end of something, but we also have the beginning of something. But we have those who want to make the beginning the end. It's rather interesting. Notice the next verse. It says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he sat, who you sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. So we got a, a new beginning, and we had an old ending. But how do we mix the two and make them both the same? In other words, we make the new beginning the end as well as the old the end. That doesn't um, make a lot of sense to me. Then, you know, we have the question that we're being inconsistent. Well, let's, let's talk about that for just a little bit. Are we being inconsistent? Because, you know, we'll see a text like... Um, 1 Peter chapter 2, and it will be argued and has been argued that um, we need to pay attention to audience relevance. So in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, uh, well, let's look at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're told, okay, this is only those who are of the diaspora. And so what we have are the 12 tribes that are being gathered. Well, we don't object to that, that we have a reference to those who were scattered, nor do we object to the fact that We're talking about the 12 tribes, but as I said before, what tribe was Abel a member of? What tribe was Enoch a member of? What tribe was Noah a member of? The text in Hebrews says these all died in faith, not having received the promise. What was the promise? The promise was resurrection from the dead. There was no distinction between what God promised in Genesis 3 and verse 15 and what he promised Abraham in Genesis 12 and verse 3. It's the same promise. And that promise was resurrection from death, from sin death. That's why they're all included in Hebrews chapter 11. These all died in faith, not having received the promise. And he didn't limit that to the descendants of Jacob only. But even if he did limit it to 
the descendants of Jacob, as we demonstrated, the descendants of Jacob included a mixed multitude from the very beginning of their redemption in Egypt. So that sounds like 12 tribes plus. But back to 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and the verses 9, after we talk about the scattered ones, in verse 9 it says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. All right, fine. But then what do we do about First Peter chapter 1, speaking of these same ones, where the text says in verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that... Uh, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Well, that's the same incorruptible, unfading, no ending kingdom and new heaven and earth that we read about in Revelation 21. And it says, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, in the next verse, or not the next verse, but in the verses to follow, inheritance is called the grace. Verse 10, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. And that's the grace that would come according to verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. That's the kingdom. The incorruptible kingdom. Now, the pressure of the no ending kingdom of this beginning was at least, I, you might say, um, uh, the pressure was felt because there was an attempt or a suggestion to deal with the no-ending kingdom by talking about a possible rapture. This is how the no-ending kingdom would be explained, possibly. Now, that's not a position that's taken just yet, but it's one that's being tossed around. Well, they get raptured, possibly. And hence, then they can continue. Well, if you take that position, then you have to give up your no end because it certainly demonstrates that they continue. But there are other issues that um, that I see with this with this concept. And um, let me mention a few more in the closing minutes that we have left. When we look in. And, and by the way, uh, if we're going to talk about um, Israel from that perspective, that included more than just blood descendants of Jacob. Because if we're talking about Israel in these passages, and that included more than the blood descendants of Jacob, since we are looking at folk from Abel on down, etc., um, it's got to be greater than the 12 tribes. It has to be. And it was greater even at the time of the redemption. But there's another passage I want to go to uh, before I leave that. Let's go to um, Exodus chapter 19. Still dealing with this consistency thing. Exodus the 19th chapter. In Exodus 19... Let's see, is that is that the one uh, that I want? I'm not sure if that's that's what I want. I might um, want to look at something else. In 
And while I'm thinking about that, let me just go on to um, to another passage. I may come back to this one in, in just a moment. But in Isaiah, the 65th chapter, Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66, let's take a look at a couple of those passages. And in Isaiah 65, Verse 17, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Now, in verses 20 through 23, and I'm not going to focus on all of these because just don't have the time. But in verse 23, it says, they shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring. So what we have here is in the new heavens and the new earth, Along with everything else that's said in verses 20 through 23, the text says they shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble, for they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord. Now, if we understand the blessed of the Lord are those who were redeemed in the last days that we just got through reading about in First Peter, then who are their descendants? Well, they shall be, and we're not talking about flesh and blood descendants from that perspective, because as I said, Israel was larger than flesh and blood descendants. They were Israel by faith in the New Testament. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my mountains, says the Lord. That's the kingdom. And that actually goes back to Genesis 3 and 14. With the action of the serpent. They shall not, as, as the serpent hurt in the garden... He says, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. But he's talking about the descendants of the blessed and their offspring. In other words, it's just like Isaiah 59, which is parallel to Isaiah 9. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth. See, there's the blessed nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants. Now, you can't take verse 20 and pull it over into the New Testament and then claim everything else is fulfilled back in the past. If you're going to take verse 20, you got to take verse 21 as well. And so he says, it shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants nor from the mouth of your descendants descendants that's the offspring it's a parallel text the blessed their descendants their offspring your mouth your descendants and the descendants of your descendants says the lord from this time forevermore that's parallel also to isaiah 9 where we gave all those hebrew definitions for Increase and no end, or at least for increase. And um, and then back to Isaiah 66. This is the time of judgment, because it is the time when vengeance is taken. Verse 6, the sound of the noise from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemies. It's a quote from Deuteronomy 32. 
Then it talks about the birth pangs that you see in Matthew 24, in Romans 8, in Revelation 12, John 16, Galatians. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such things, a a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery? Some say there are no children, says the Lord. Shall I cause, or I who cause delivery, shut up the womb? Those are questions that are to be answered with a negative. God is not bringing them to the, that's what happened in Isaiah 26. They said, we have been in pain, we have labored, but we have brought forth nothing. We brought forth wind. That wasn't the case here. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you who mourn for her. That you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom. That's Matthew 5. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed on her sides, and you shall be carried and be dandled on her knees as one whom his mother comforts. So I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Verse 18 For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall be that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and those among them who escape I will send to the nations, to Tarshish and Paul and Lud, who draw the bow, and to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands afar, afar off, who have not heard my fame or seen my glory. Why is he talking about those who have not seen his fame or his glory after this judgment and this woman has given birth? And they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Well, that's about all the time that we had uh, for today. Just some of the questions that I have. Maybe uh, there are some answers, but I will have a very hard time with an answer that says the end is the end, but no end is also the end. That just doesn't make sense. A lot of sense to me. Well, I hope that um, you've gained some uh, insights from what we've said, and uh, I'm sure I'll get plenty of feedback, but that's uh, fine, and uh, we continue to study. We continue to encourage you to study the Word of God. We look forward to having Don back with us on next week, and until that time, I'm William Bell, uh, one half of the team of two guys in the Bible saying have a very pleasant uh, evening. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Dunn Preston and myself, we'd like to say, have a very pleasant day, and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust.